You come to me and you say, Shylock. Shooting was over. Editing was set to begin. This time, Wells had reached his goal. But then the negatives vanished. The theft couldn't be explained. Another defeat, new wounds. Years later, Wells unpacked his camera and filmed the Shylock speech which had always been missing from his Merchant of Venice. He hath disgraced me. Laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, scorned my nation. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. If not a Jew, hands. It's not a Jew eyes, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions. Fed with the same food, heard with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same summer and winter. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. The villainy you teach us, we will execute. It shall go hard. Better the instruction. So I was uh, noticing <laughs> continuity between the product films dating back to uh, Citizen Kane, as your view seems to be opposed to some of the best interests of the corporate elite, of which you speak directly about in uh, the trial. And I was wondering if you thought your personal financial position as a film director is directly related to the fact that a lot of your views and your films throughout these ages have not uh, exactly expressed their interests. Would anybody like to answer that question? Uh, well, my personal opinion. <laughs> Good, stand up, let's hear it. My personal opinion is that it's true, and that uh, from the, what I've read from your career, although I wasn't alive at the time you first were making films, <laughs> that, uh, that you've had a tremendous problem with uh, the press and corporate bureaucracy dating back, you know, since the earliest portions of your career, and that this is continuing today, and that's one of the reasons why you've been unable to finish uh, some of your more recent projects. Well, the only, uh, there, there are only two main projects which are unfinished. One is uh, uh, the other side of the wind, and when I tell you that my partner in that project is the brother-in-law of the late Shah of Iran. You will understand why we are having a little legal difficulty. <laughs> the other unfinished film is Don Quixote, which was a private exercise of mine. And it will be finished as an author will finish it at my own good time, when I feel like it. It is not unfinished because of financial reasons. And when it is released, its title is going to be when are you going to finish Don Quixote? When asked about his unfinished projects, Wells was often evasive. His reputation for not finishing films weighed upon him. When the other side of the wind could not be completed, this only fulfilled some people's expectations. He would always be celebrated as the man who made Citizen Kane. But as soon as he launched his new projects, he met with a rejection. I, 
you know, accepted. What do you understand under that? Accepted, no, if, uh, if you think of a script. You know, he takes a script to a studio and studio refused to make it. Then, of course, he wasn't accepted. But otherwise, yes, he was accepted very much. So he had a lot of friends, made a new friend, young movie directors, new actors. He had a great time. He loved to be around the young people. When we made The Other Side of the Wind, our crew consisted basically of very, very young people, 19, 20. Once we had to shoot certain scenes from The Other Side of the Wind on a real studio lot but we couldn't afford the fee. So we chose one weekend when we were sure that nobody would be there working. We entered the lot as a film students while Orson was hidden in a van. Whenever a guard passed by, he took a cover. You know, this situation did not make him upset or frustrated. He actually loved to trick them. But of course, the trick couldn't last after the weekend, so he stayed awake for 48 hours while his cameraman took shift and slept. Of course, we had disappointments and sad moments when Orson used to say black dogs were barking at the door. But he never allowed them to enter to win over our moods. He would immediately invent a story to chase them away. You cannot imagine what kind of theater I had in my living room. All Shakespeare was played there. He was great Romeo. And you know that he was a great Juliet. He. Uh, Oh, he was such a fun. One day, while looking at some old footage called One Man Band, where he played all the different characters, he joked and said, I myself have always been One Man Band. He was planning to do his autobiographical film, and this was going to be its title. Oh, oh! oh uh, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to uh, Swinging London. I say, this thing is on, isn't it? One man band is coming. Dig my street box of him. That's me. Drum, drum, drum. Here comes the one man band. One man band is coming. Take that music of it. That's me. Drum, drum, drum. Here comes the one man band. The one man band is coming. Here comes the one man band. We continue our swinging tour with a visit to Carnaby Street, the mecca of the Hep Cats. Uh, this is not, in fact, Carnaby Street. This is somewhere else. Up there is Father Rides beneath the bedclothes and a funny little squeaker. Well, this isn't actually our Carnaby Street, but I'm sure that... Hear them tell him he's a shilling. Now go away. <laughs> Now among the bright lights of swinging London, the new play, Playground of the International Jet Set. Please, by my pilots. London. Wow. London, it's certainly changed in the last couple of years. <laughs> Violet. Please, by my violets. <laughs> no, thank you. <clears throat> dirty postcards. Please, by my dirty postcards. Nice, filthy postcards. What? Uh, oh, um, um, not just at the moment. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and now we're in the heart of London's clubland. Why don't we take a look in at one of these famous clubs? Take it away, baby. You want to see pretty lady do slip, please? I think acting is like sculpture. In other words, it's, it's what you take away from yourself to reveal the truth of what you're doing that makes a performance. A performance, when it is, deserves to be considered great or important, is always entirely made up of the actor himself and entirely achieved by what he has left in the dressing room before he came out in front of the camera. 
There is no such thing as becoming another character by putting on a lot of makeup. You may need to put the makeup, but what you're really doing is, is uh, undressing yourself and even tearing yourself apart and presenting to the public that part of you which corresponds to what you were playing. And there is a villain in each of us, a murderer in each of us, a fascist in each of us, a, uh, a saint in each of us. And the actor is the man or woman who can eliminate from himself those things which will interfere with that truth. believe in magic well you do believe your eyes don't you